Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Question Time with myself, Harry Knight. Once again, I'm going to be going through some of your questions and comments from our various social media posts and doing my best to provide some answers. Now, our first question this episode comes from Bofa. Um, I'm not totally sure if that's a, a, a name or a YouTube handle, but uh, Bofa's question was, how do you tell whether you are a front-footed surfer, a back-footed surfer, or a neutral-footed surfer? Um, and this is a, a, an interesting question. Um, the, the, the term being a back-footed surfer goes, goes back to the uh, sort of 1970s um, when you had, you know, the, the, the standard board of the day with that sort of teardrop-shaped single fin. And uh, to be a, to, to surf those boards, you had to move around on the board a lot. You had to move forwards, move backwards. And to be a back-footed surfer was somebody that, you know, really wasn't afraid to get all the way back over the tail, do a really big, aggressive, powerful turn on the wave. Um, which was, you know, kind of a risky thing to do because you'd, you'd actually have to physically move your body back up the board in order to recover properly. Um, so it was kind of a, a compliment um, to, to be called a, a back-footed surfer. Now, um, for modern surfing, and, and, and Bofa did specify that he or she was, was specifically asking about um, modern performance shortboarding. Um, the idea of being back-footed or front-footed doesn't really exist anymore. The, the, the board design has evolved and, and the way that we use our bodies has evolved. And there is really nothing now that you would do, you know, that, that we think of as performance shortboarding, where you're not using your back foot and front foot equally. Um, if you watch, you know, watch the best surfs in the world, whether it's, you know, Jordy Smith or John John Florence or Gabrielle Medina, uh, you know, watch any of those guys and how they use their bodies. And, and within one maneuver, you'll see them 100% of their weight over their back foot and 100% of their weight over their front foot. And the boards are designed to accommodate that. And it's, it's actually something we do here. You know, all of our students right from day one, we try to get them comfortable with the idea of moving weight uh, from front foot to back foot using your hips whilst keeping the shoulders fairly still because it's the best way to control a modern board without losing your balance. Now, that being said, um, I do see some consistencies in how people, you know, if somebody's going to make an error on a wave, there is some consistency as to whether they're likely to have a bit too much weight on their front foot or a bit too much weight on their back foot. Okay. Now, what I mean by that, uh, Rue's uh, recent uh, quick tips episode on carving versus trimming turns, I'll put a link uh, down below if you guys haven't seen that. But um, we're talking about the difference between what we call here a trimming turn and a carving turn. Um, and just to expand on that a little bit, I'm going to draw a diagram. This might, this might take me a second, so stand by. Okay, now this, uh, believe it or not, this is, <laughs> this is a diagram of, of uh, some board controls that I want to talk about. Um, now, if, if this is the deck of our surfboard, the, uh, and thinking not about where we're putting our feet, but where we're putting the center of our weight, over the top of the board, which we can manipulate by moving our feet or by moving our hips. Now, the fastest place that we can put our weight is here, okay? This red, uh, this blue dot in the middle of the board. That is neutral trim. That's where the board's just gonna be skimming across the surface as fast as it can possibly go. Now, there are ways that we can maneuver the board on the wave to add speed, but the fastest just neutral speed of the board will be with our weight right there, okay? now. Then coming back, what I've got is these two kind of ladders, okay? And if you imagine these ladders, we've got numbers from 1 to 10 running down each side. And what I'd like to think about is we've got two scales. We can bring our weight back from our front foot towards our back foot, okay? And let's do a 1 to 10 scale there. 1 to 10 works well with most humans. And we can also bring our weight from our left rail to our right rail. Let's have a 1 to 10 scale there as well. So. What I want you to think about is, is any time that you're doing a carving turn, what we really want to do is to balance those two scales. We come back five out of 10. We want to go onto the rail five out of 10, and that will keep the weight, the center of our weight running down this ladder, and it will produce a really nice carving turn. Doing a, a carving turn is almost like sitting on a knife edge. Um, you know, we've got to really balance the board like that. Now, if we bring the weight back, more than we bring it onto the rails. We move the weight into this red area back here. And what we produce, what we do is we slow the board down more than we turn. Now that's not always a bad thing. Um, 
pivotal turns on big long boards are done from this area. We set a lot of weight back and we sort of pivot the board around. Uh, they're done from in there. Those kind of little stall turns, little kick turns that you see some really good surfers doing to pull into a barrel, they're done from this area as well. Now, if we bring the weight onto the rail more than we bring it back, we bring the weight into, uh, into these areas here, okay? And this is what we would call a trimming turn, okay? And we're running the risk of burying the rail, okay? Now, you will see surfers uh, it, where, you know, they're going in for a big, powerful rail turn, those three surfs I mentioned before, uh, you know, all very, very good at big, powerful surfing. Um, if you look at their mechanics, you'll actually see they're sitting a lot of weight into their back foot when they do that rail turn. The reason is they're going really, really fast. And the back end of the board here is producing a lot of lift and they have to sit a lot of weight back um, to keep, uh, to, to run that knife edge and not, not actually bury the rail. But the, the, the truth remains that in order to do a really nice carving turn, we, we basically want our center of weight somewhere on one of these two ladders, okay? Um, if you find that you are, when you go for your turns, you know, you, you, as you go for that turn, the board does turn, but it kind of runs out of speed and the wave goes on without you. We're probably bringing the weight into this red area, okay? If you go for the turn and rather than the board, you know, turning around, the rail digs in and you fall off the side, we probably got the weight into this blue area here. And, and like I said, what I do see is some consistency with that. Um, for myself, if I'm going to make a mistake either way, I'm more likely to dig my rail in than I am to stall the board out. That, that just happens to be me. I, I have a tendency to put a little bit too much weight into my front foot through turns. Um, would I describe myself as a front-footed or back-footed server? No. Uh, because like I say, I think that terminology is a little bit outdated, but from a coaching perspective, it is sometimes good to just be aware of if you're defaulting to too much pressure on the rail or too much pressure on the tail, to be aware of that. So anyway, I, I hope that's useful. Um, yes, I hope that, that sort of cleared up uh, that, that little linguistic uh, thing, and I hope that's a, a useful little bit of information for you. Right, next question. So our next question comes from Tom Schelling, and uh, Tom had a meteorology-related question, which actually uh, quite a lot of you guys did off the back of, of last week's episode. Now, um, we are going to answer those questions, but actually uh, myself and Will have been working on a whole series of the Surfing Explained uh, animations that are going to be all about meteorology. So don't worry, all of you guys that ask some super interesting questions, we're going to answer them, uh, but we're going to answer them with some cool animations. Uh, now, Tom, your question was uh, not one of the things that we were going to tackle. Uh, so Tom's question was, uh, why is it that uh, at, at, at his local break in New York, um, when the wave period jumps up to around you know 10 seconds or more, a lot of the waves start to just kind of close out and the beaches aren't maybe as, as, as good as they could be. Whereas when he goes on vacation down to Costa Rica or Mexico, you know, he can get some pretty long period swells, you know, 15, 16, 17 seconds, and the waves are still peeling nicely. Um, so firstly, great observation, Tom. That's, that's, that's awesome. Um, the second thing is uh, what we're basically seeing is that beaches particularly are shaped by the waves that, that, are, that are hitting them, okay? Um, as the tide goes in and out and the waves come, uh, you know, roll up the beach, they move sand around. And basically, they move sand around in a way that channels the energy that, that, that the waves are delivering. So uh, in New York, for example, you know, especially through the summer months, you know, you might expect fairly low period wind swell most of the time, you know, six, seven, eight seconds. Um, and the beaches will kind of settle down into a way that, that manages that, that power of swell. Now, as the period of a swell increases, um, the power in the waves increases almost exponentially because what we're really talking about is the, the area of a circle. You know, we've spoken before about how the waves are these rolling cylinders. The area of a circle, it's a, a squared equation, pi r squared. So as that uh, area increases, the power of the waves increases a lot. And, and if you suddenly, you know, we get to the end of summer, we move to, into, the, uh, into the autumn, that first big, you know, 
10, 11, 12 second swell suddenly hits this beach, the sandbars basically can't cope with it. The sandbars get blown apart, all the sand gets moved around, we might get lots of rips, we might see lots of waves just closing out on a sandbar that just really isn't shaped to deal with that sort of power. So that that's why uh, you'll you'll see that happening. Now, conversely, you know, down here in Costa Rica, kind of 10, 11, 12 seconds, like that's that's almost low period swell for us. And, uh, you know, an average swell hitting our beach is, is probably more in the 14, 15, 16 second uh, category. So that's kind of the swell that shapes our sandbars most of the time. Um, we still see the same effect, uh, but we'll see it when we get a real big, you know, 19, 20, you know, 20 plus second swell, if that hits our beaches, it'll do the same thing. It'll rip sandbars apart. We'll have rips charging through the lineup. There's a lot of waves that will just kind of close out. Um, now, the, the, there's another side to this, which is that most surf areas will have these sort of their local mystery spot that, you know, it only breaks once or twice a year when you do get those exceptional long period swells. And, and learning where those waves are and, and what conditions they break in is a, a you know, really useful uh, time spent so that when you do see that big swell coming in, we don't necessarily go to our local beach uh, that, that isn't going to be working so well. And instead, we go to you know, this, this spot that can handle that swell. Uh, on a more local side, different beaches, again, because of the, the way that they're angled into the swell, perhaps, or because of their local bathymetry, Different beaches do deal with swells differently. Um, there's a beach near us here that, you know, there are waves, um, but, but over about 16 seconds, it's, it's going to close out. I know above 16 seconds that this one beach will close out. Whereas I know that below about, you know, 10 or 12 seconds, there's another beach that isn't very good. And so depending on what I'm seeing in the forecast, I'll go to one of these two beaches, depending on, on which one's going to handle that swell best. And, and, you know, if you can make observations similar to what Tom made, but, but, you know, don't just assume that your whole coastline is, is operating the same. Check different beaches and see how they handle different swells from different directions with different power. Um, and that will allow you to make much better calls. You know, that, that one day that you have, to uh, drop everything and go surfing, you want to know which which beach is going to be handling the swell the best. Cool. Well, I, I, I hope that was interesting. Um, I hope that was useful information. Um, that's all I've got for you this week. Um, but if you have any other questions, if you have any comments, please throw them in down below. Um, again, without your questions, I, I don't have anything to talk about. So keep them coming. Um, take care, and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.